Welcome to my one hectare off-grid forest garden homestead. I'm Rob Handy and we are here on the northern slopes of the Mendip Hills in Somerset. 13 years ago I was fortunate enough to be able to buy a hectare of land. I've always been interested in self-sufficiency and I thought the best way, best in terms of the least input for the maximum output and what would be best to restore the land to a diverse habitat would be to create a forest garden. And for those of you who've been following me for a while, I would like to share with you some of the successes and failures over the last 13 years of having been here on the land. The first one that springs to mind is that I was very enthusiastic when I started and I wanted to do everything immediately. I got the forest gardening book by Martin Crawford and I thought, right, I'm going to plant all 500 of these species that I'd labelled in the, in the book. And I put a lot of effort into planting all of them and trying to take care of them. I went too big too quickly. It was too high maintenance. If I were to start a project like this again, I would almost certainly cultivate a very small area first, wait till that's successful and getting things established before then moving on to another section. The second failure or challenge that springs to mind is water. It's very difficult to live anywhere without water, let alone establish a homestead like this when both poultry, plants, especially new seedlings, and myself need water. And during the first couple of years, the only water source I had wasn't even on my land. It was a couple of fields away, and I spent two or three hours a day, during the summer mostly, carrying buckets of water when a little bit of research and planning would have meant I could create my own rainwater harvesting system a lot sooner and worked out how to harvest the trickle of a spring that is on my land. Something else I would definitely do differently if starting again now is I would have one singular place to live with everything under one roof. But as it is, I started off with a yurt that I slept in and then I thought this yurt isn't big enough for a kitchen so I had a caravan next door it's like having a house, but all the rooms are separate over the garden. For example, I have a shed that's my shower and toilet shed. I have a shepherd's hut that's my bedroom, a yurt that's my kitchen. But in the wintertime especially, it's quite difficult when I have to walk wee willy winky style in my dressing gown from the toaster yurt over to the freezing shepherd's hut to go to bed. If I were to start again, I would definitely have everything in one place, in one tiny house. Another failure, or perhaps something I would do differently, is along the lines of the original going too big too soon, and that is getting geese. I did want geese, and I've had them for six years now, and now that they're here, they're a really important part of the ecosystem. They are great at keeping foxes away, from the ducks and chickens. They are also fantastic monogastric mowers and they walk around mowing all the grass paths. But at that time, the garden wasn't well enough established and the original 500 species of plants and trees and, and berries that I had was very quickly reduced to about 200. In the first week alone, they mowed all my chicory, all my Swiss chard, picked every strawberry and bit the tops off a lot of things just because they can. The ducks, however, have been a great success over the years. They are an integral part of the ecosystem because ducks, especially khaki campbells, eat slugs. And not only slugs, but slug eggs in the winter. And in the early years, I spent a lot of time picking slugs off all my salad crops, but now the ducks do it for me. It's said that no one has a slug problem, they have a duck deficiency, and you need about six ducks per acre to keep on top of the slugs. But second to that, 
ducks lay eggs. And not just any eggs, but the eggs are more protein rich than chicken eggs. They have omega oils in, which is very important if you're vegetarian. Plus they are just such happy creatures. So the ducks have been a huge success. Two years ago, I had to take nearly a whole year off from the garden. And that actually made it an inadvertent experiment to see what will actually thrive with zero maintenance. And I was quite surprised. Even though I lost quite a few of the perennial vegetables, as a rule, pretty much everything above grass height absolutely thrived. Well, the myriad berry bushes and currant bushes, all the fruit and nut trees, all the vines like the grapes and kiwis and passion flowers. The beehives are absolutely booming and the bees multiply in number to occupy the vacant hives. The few perennial vegetables that did survive have outcompeted the grass and now I know that they truly are maintenance free. And those are things like the perennial leeks, the Welsh onions, the sweet clumping bamboo, the sweet Sicily, the tree kale. So by having an accidental year off, it's really been a true example of survival of the fittest. I'm going to concentrate on small guilds of companion planted annuals from now on, which do take a lot of work, but then you get a lot more yield per square foot. So mix up little guilds of annual vegetables with the already established food forest. And the last success is a little bit general, but it's the whole thing. It's the fact that I've been here for 13 years now with a baby on my own off-grid forest garden homestead, living off the land. I mean, there's no such thing as 100% self-sufficiency, but I'm getting there and learning many more lessons along the way every day. And the process is, I was going to say fun, it's not always fun, but it's satisfying and motivating and I feel alive.